Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> just, just have a seat. Uh, going to be starting here shortly. My name is Steve Gobby from Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and we are here to do best paper session number two. And the three subcommittees is education, training, and HEPA that you'll be hearing uh, this afternoon. And uh, just some housekeeping rules for you, you know, in case uh, speakers up here. Uh, make sure your cell phones are turned off. Uh, just be courteous. If you need to leave the room while the presenter is talking, just make sure you're quiet and can leave out the back, back exit there. Uh, also, too, there's no photography or video during the session. And uh, so we're ready to get started. Let me turn to the first slide here. So our first presenter is representing the Education Subcommittee, and it's pre being presented by Dr. Summer B uh, Rybinski, and she's a research scientist at uh, APNA and previously a research fellow at, at AFRL. Uh, Dr. Rybinski currently manages Air Force and DARPA efforts, and her efforts focus on virtual, augmented, and extended reality. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Summer Rybinski. Thank you everyone for attending the session. Um, I want to take a moment and um, mention my co-authors, Dr. Samantha Perry and uh, Dr. Winston Wink Bennett. So chances are if you're in this session, um, I don't need to sell you on the benefits of adaptive training. You're here to figure out how to do it effectively and you already know that there's a lot of gains in individualizing training. From the um, notes from General Brown, we know that we need to change the way that we train in order to meet the future demands um, in each one of the branches. Across a variety of domains, we've seen that adaptive training can improve accuracy, can improve performance, reduce proficiency timelines, and um, increase effectiveness in a variety of topics and domains. So throughout these slides, I'm going to cover aspects to consider when you're developing adaptive training systems, and then also how we could create uh, rapid prototypes of adaptive sims using game development technology and the benefits that come out of this approach. So first, when do we adapt? In traditional settings, often you can uh, map this to macro level adaptation. People take placement exams or assessments that place them in either remedial, regular, or advanced classes. We measure them at key points and apply it to the course level. There's benefits to this because it's quick and it's low cost. It's also feasible in a lot of domains, but it still isn't at that individual level that we need. General David Allen in the opening um, fireside discussion mentioned that we need to move beyond time-based training and instead ind individualize it. Within simulation, that's entirely within the realm of possibility by us targeting micro-level adaptation. It's individualized to each person who receives training content that's specialized for them, but it can be very resource intensive, usually requires models and a lot of assessments can be high cost, but it is feasible within a lot of simulation environments. And you also have more opportunities to expedite training by measuring throughout a training scenario um, and being able to actually live adapt. So there's are two main approaches that you can use for when to adapt. And now we'll talk about how you adapt. Traditionally, we can think of early versions of adaptation training as scenario paths, sort of like Oregon Trail when you make decisions and you reach particular outcomes you could have training paths that would give you to either uh, more difficult or less difficult scenarios that target specific skills. But within simulation, we can actually adapt the scenario elements. We can make the environment more demanding, put more um, adversaries in front of the trainee. We can target specific skills. We can also change the difficulty in, in two different ways. We could increase difficulty, so as soon as someone reaches a passing score, they could move on to a more difficult scenario or we could go a dynamic approach in which trainees are presented with scenarios that keep them right at the cusp of where their skill's at. It challenges them to keep them engaged versus bored or over-challenged or stressed. And there's benefits to both. And then we also have adaptation logic in which we are either rule-based 
in which you apply a set of rules um, that say if they re reach a certain score on a, a few different elements, they move on. Um, or we can be, do data-based. We can have models that say someone is proficient enough to move on. But those can require machine learning and an initial data set, which I'll cover specifically adaptation logic in more detail later in this presentation. So then we also have what do we adapt? In early days of adapta uh, adaptive training, uh, it was mainly feedback. Like a good coach, a coach will tell you what you did well and what you could improve on and gives you tips for, to do better next time. But what we see now in simulation is we have the whole world in front of us. We can uh, look at their performance in previous scenarios and make suggestions for what they receive next. <coughs> Ideally, these would target knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics. For example, decision-making scenarios could be prioritized if we find that they're particularly deficit in um, their decision-making skills. We could also do it live within a scenario. If we find that someone is in a dogfighting scenario and they're uh, performing at the level that we'd like, we could actually dynamically make it more challenging during that scenario instead of waiting for them to complete that scenario. For trainees that are underperforming, we could actually provide queuing. So if we find that a pilot who is uh, first time in the aircraft isn't looking at key instruments, we can start to use simulation to draw their attention and fix those scan patterns during the scenario instead of afterwards in debriefs. So, um, when we design adaptive systems, we want it to be related to the training outcomes and adapt based on those. Again, in some of the introductory uh, conversations, Van Sullivan said we need to look at data, we need to adapt training, and improve system development as a result. And the only way we can do that is by putting the end goals at the beginning. We need to ask, what do we want each trainee to be proficient in at the end? And as a result, what inputs are we capturing to be able to say confidently that we're achieving readiness. And those will allow us to figure out which elements we need to build in, not only to our adaptation logic, but also um, the scenarios that we present the trainee. So in this example along the bottom, if we're trying to train for team performance, there's more to that than just a score within a simulation. We want to target constructs like cohesion, communication, and conflict. And by breaking this down to the elements in total that we want out of team performance, we're able to build in inputs that target each of these. So for example, if a team demonstrates poor conflict management, the next scenario that we present them with can be prioritized in targeting that skill specifically. So this really boils down to our adaptation inputs. So we present a lot of different concepts here of things that you can change and modularize and build into adaptive sims. But what do you do when everything's an option? In surgery training scenarios, we'll want a mastery level focus. They'll want to go under different scenarios repetitively so that they can go out into the field with confidence and have been under a, a variety of situations. So in that scenario, many performance aspects will be important such as accuracy, time to complete, and measuring their skill decay over time so that we can figure out when they need um, additional training. However, if we're targeting things like stress trainers, we'll want to consider more things than just performance indicators, like stress metrics, including physio, or even uh, subjective measures within that. Trainees, trainers that look at um, specific skills that are individual to the person, such as memory trainers, will want to consider things about the individual trainee, such as their demographics. So it's really what we're looking at for the training goals in order to figure out what inputs we build into the simulator, as well as the costs and what you have available to you. So ideally, I ask you guys to challenge yourself on what is readiness. What do we consider good performance? And if we have a definition of that, um, are meeting the thresholds and perfect performance the same? Likely someone who goes through a tra training scenario with confidence, completes it with very little errors, um, and demonstrates everything we expect out of an expert is not the same as someone who barely passed. So we need to start building within simula simulators the subtleties that allow us to distinguish between novices and experts so everyone can be at the same level of readiness. So I'm going to take you guys through just a little exercise of someone, let's say, who's trying to be a medic, and we're just teaching them how to suture, a very basic task. So on the left-hand side, we have three different trainees. So we see trainee number one 
Um, he has some skewness in his stitches that's keeping him, that is not as nice and tidy as we'd like to see. Training number two is experiencing very high stress and it makes his hands a bit shaky and often probably in a combat situation um, is not what you would like to see out of a medic. And for trainee number three, we see that he's taking five times longer as the other trainees. If we only had one performance metric within our simulation, one of these would be considered ready while the other would not, or the other would be not ready and would uh, demonstrate, uh, would not be demonstrated unless we had all three of these inputs built within the system. So we wanna make sure that we're uh, multiple metrics so that we're really reflecting the construct of interest. And so those inputs also then feed into how we adapt. So as I was speaking about earlier, we have two different types here, rule-based and model-based. Rule-based is easy. You can start with that. You can talk with a subject matter expert and figure out what thresholds there are that would be considered good enough performance. But as we add in more inputs, it gets increasingly complex. If you have just one metric that has a passing score and a failing score, you have two potential outcomes, harder or easier. But as soon as you add a second input, you now have a matrix of someone who has good performance in both inputs, bad performance in both inputs, but what do you do when they perform well in one skill and worse in the other? What content do you present them next? So as you add more inputs in your simulator, it gets exponentially more difficult. However, model-based logic can allow you to predict some really amazing things about the trainee, but they require um, generating data and validating that data. But we would be able to um, create predictions on how likely they are to succeed in the next training scenario we give them, figure out the best training plan compared to experts, and even predict their state of knowledge and target scenarios that fill their knowledge gaps. So all of this is great, and I've presented a lot of different ways um, in which you can consider developing an effective one, but two points are still true. One, it can be very cost prohibitive to go after this whole process and actually develop an adaptive training sim. And often we see that adaptive training sims currently in the research community have low relevance to live operations. So I posit that we can use game-based development software as it can be used by novice developers and on rapid timelines. Me as a human factors researcher, I've been able to mess around in Unity and Unreal and make a simplistic scenario. So we can stand up something very quickly and just put it in front of trainees and see how they react. We can rapidly prototype within it, connect with uh, sensors of all kinds, physiological and so on, and also implement various adaptation capabilities. So there's an opportunity where we can leverage, I'm sure as many of you have seen out on the ETSIC floor, there is a wide variety of high fidelity simulators with 3D models and environments that could be leveraged within game-based technology to develop these adaptation methods. So I'm gonna walk through basically a process diagram. Each one that I'm speaking to at the time will be in the green bolded line. So first, walk through your conceptual design. Also within some of the opening uh, uh, discussions, Vice Admiral Francis Morley said, for innovation, we ask why. Why are we implementing this adaptation or this adaptive system? And so if you're able to answer your why and what you want to be able to train them in, you'd go through and figure out how are you going to adapt. Um, often you can start with rule-based and figure out your adaptation strategy, which in micro adaptation and simulation would be very uh, effective to do. You figure out when, whether you want to assess them before each scenario, after each scenario, or during a scenario live, depending on the kind of inputs that you have. And then lastly, figuring out what elements you're gonna adapt. Will you make the environment more challenging? Will you provide them tailored feedback? Um, change the content that they're presented with, or even the pacing to make it more uh, rapid for the trainee. So then, using an initial development, you can create a small set of scenarios within game-based technology using engines like Unity and Unreal. Build in those inputs that really get at the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics that's relevant to say that someone is a proficient trainee. And then what you're able to do is just start collecting data. 
run them through preliminary data using trainees or SMEs that you have access to and see how those scenarios respond. Collect data using um, rule-based logic and then build, that data can also be used to build the models or AI so that you can pivot to a model-based approach that predicts the likelihood of success through tra different training, um, training paths. So once you've stood up basically a V1 of your game-based development uh, sim, you can then iterate on that design. When you run someone through a training scenario, you may find that you need to tweak your adaptation logic, especially with people of different skill sets. You may find that it was too stringent or too forgiving, and you may need to tweak that. You may also find that you, uh, adaptation should occur more or less frequently. People may peak in performance early on, um, and so you find that you need to adapt um, end the scenarios more quickly and adapt more frequently. And then you may also find that there's other elements that could be adapted, should be adapted, or at greater levels. Once you've had this uh, stood up, there's a lot of next steps that you can take. One, within Unity and Unreal, there's a lot of object-oriented programming. So once you have a rule set that's built out, you can apply it to a new setting. Say that you take a ground-based training that has the same types of inputs that would be crucial critical for someone within an aircraft. You can change the 3D models and the environments and the controls, but that same rule set can be applied to a new adaptation training and then run through again and see if anything needs to be tweaked for that specific setting. But once you have stood up one within game-based uh, development technology, porting it to a new environment is easier to do. Next, the obvious one is furthering the research field. You can publish what you found um, are effective adaptation strategies so that others can leverage them within their own simulators as well. Next, you can use it as a testbed to explore augmentation technologies. So as I was discussing earlier, if we have a trainee who's underperforming, we could use it to help train scan patterns. So we can use game-based technology adaptive systems to actually look at what AI, AR, VR capabilities can we provide in operations and use that as a testbed to see and what situations could those support technologies be helpful? Next, we can transfer those lessons learned to high fidelity adaptive systems or live training. The main benefit of game-based development technology is its low cost and rapid development. So we can figure out the solutions in a more modular and low cost system that's unclassified and then translate those findings to the classified or harder to edit um, setting once we know what those solutions are. And lastly, we can find correlations among adaptation inputs to simplify that design. Unfortunately, we live in a world where we have budgets and we have classified spaces. So we're not always gonna be able to collect all the data that we'd like. But what we can do in game-based sims is find correlations between them. So if we have sensors or we have data that may be difficult in terms of resources, CPU power or cost, or even the amount of time it takes to censor someone up before a training session, and we're able to correlate that with other indicators that can be captured in the background of the simulator, then we can still retain a level of accuracy in the adaptation logic while using fewer sensors. And so it's an opportunity for us to also explore new potential indicators of proficiency and readiness um, so that we can de design adaptive systems that use less but still retain that effectiveness. So this sort of approach and this paper was bred out of um, us actually building a simulator that uses this approach and it's modular for those research uh, capabilities. So if you wanna see an instantiation of a test bed like this, you can see that at the Air Force Service Squad, booth number 1539, um, in which you can see a test bed that we were pretty much at the re redesign, redesign and refine stage. Um, and I'll also be there between uh, five and six tonight if anyone wants to talk through uh, designing test beds like that with me. But at this time, I wanted to um, Give a shout out to the Grill the Gaming Research Integration for Learning Lab that funded this work. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Anybody have any questions? I don't see any hands. Yes.
Right. Um, so if I'm tracking your question, one of the benefits, um, in my opinion, of being able to use the game-based systems is their ability to connect with the um, sensors and other inputs that we have connected to the simulator. We can actually create one whole log file of data that time syncs not only the scenario events, but any input given by the trainee, as well as any responses and external sensors that we have hooked up. So we can actually see response time between any of the stimuli that they're presented with and be able to um, adjust that. One of the other benefits I didn't highlight very well is that within game-based sim, you can actually, it's called exposing things as variables. So I can actually go through and on the fly say, I would actually like the scenario to be three minutes long. And let me go ahead and make the stimuli 20% uh, stronger, whether it's be a noise or say, I would like this to occur when they're in the middle of a turn. You can expose all those things as modular components that I can play around with, put someone in, see how that goes, and then change things around and run them again. So compared to a lot of other simulators that are on the market, even though they may not be a one-to-one -one comparison with the fidelity of the real world, we can target those. And ideally, the level of fidelity really comes down to what are you trying to train. So in a lot of decision-making scenarios, we may not need a, a real-world one-to-one. We just need to um, uh, invoke the same level of constraints that they would experience um, decision-making in the real world. Thank you guys for your time.
Good afternoon. Uh, this is Best Paper Session 2, and we're on our second paper today. Uh, so our next presentation is actually from the training subcommittee. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be presented by Edgar Lamanure. He uh, holds a PhD in computer engineering from the University of Leeds in England. He's currently a full professor at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering at the Federal University of Uberlandia in Brazil and has experience in the field of engineering and computer science and supported by extended reality. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Edgar Lamanure. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here for this presentation. Uh, at the end of my speak, I'm going to show the rest of my, my team. Uh, this work is more related to how to help people who have suffered a stroke. As you can imagine, before having a stroke, doing Simple tasks like this is very easy, very natural. But after a stroke, it becomes very, very difficult for the patients. Some tend to use elbow or trunk to do a simple task like that. Other, they have a lot of difficulty and they sometimes use the healthy arm to do the same task. Others give it up and just do if the health arm. So our objective here is try to help these people through technology. Actually, stroke is the second leading cause of death in the world. The first one, if I'm not wrong, is heart disease. And as you can see in the film, that lady who suffered a stroke She's struggling a lot just to raise her arm. And as you also can see like that, she is trying to use the elbow or the shoulder to do a very simple movement. And so what happens? They lost their ability to do simple tasks. So they need to go through a lot of uh, recovery protocols so they can maybe try to get a real life or a, a normal life. As you can see, just trying to move the arm a little bit, the leg goes as well. So they have to go to a learning process again. They have to relearn how to use the arm who suffer from stroke. And we need to start doing this quickly because Studies have shown that most of the recovery happens in the three or first month. And if we don't do this quickly, they may not recover 100% what they lost. But when you do the recovery, there are a lot of problems. They suffer. As you can see, it's not easy for them to stand in that chair trying to do those movements. And sometimes for them it's tedious, they get tired, and they lost motivation. And in traditional approaches, the therapists try to help them only by eye, only using vision. And so you have to leave the therapist to say if the movement is OK or not OK. So a great problem is this compensatory movement, either from the trunk, or the elbow to do the correct movement. And if this is not correct, the patient is not going to get the movement as the, the therapist would like to. So what we are proposing here, it's a system based in virtual reality techniques where you can detect automatically that the patient is using some compensatory movements and tell him he, he cannot do that. And uh, together with this virtual reality application, we use 
with zero games, so it can get more interesting for the patient. So this is our proposal. We have, I would say, three great models. The first one, we put a lot of trackers in the patient so we can detect somehow the movement. The second one, we have provided this robot platform where we can get the intention of the movement of the patient, and he does this kind of movement to control an ego in a serious game. So in this game, we, together with the therapist, we provide three levels. So the patient can go up, up in his learning process. Uh, in the first level, uh, it's very simple. Just have to take the ego through some circles and to get used it with very simple movements. So we talked to the guys from the health area and they told us what they need. And then we try to transform their needs in something specific in the game. So for doing this kind of movement in these circles, it's just trying to relearn how to do very simple movements. The another phase, the patient has to catch some fishes. So he has to move the handle of the robotic platform. And in this movement, we analyzing uh, the flexion of the elbow and the extension. And then during the game, we can detect some kinds of compensatory movement if it takes place. And the third and more difficult one, uh, the ego is supposed to collect some food. And uh, in this field, there are some predators. And then uh, in this phase, the patient usually needs to have some more skills, have learned better how to control his arm. And then uh, the therapist can identify the progress. So each case of a stroke is very specific. So if you take two different patients, the kind of protocol I have to apply to one of them is not the same for the other. Again, with the, the specialists, the experts, we provide a kind of control panel where the physiotherapist can uh, program, configure the kind of difficulty, for example, in level one, how many circles is going to put there for the patient, how big is going to be the circles. So he first does an evaluation of the patient, and then he understands which one is the best way to prepare the game. So the game is customable, OK? And we have this different kind of trackers when we position the tracker, the trackers in the patient, so each tracker has a goal to analyze a compensatory movement. So I have trackers uh, to put in the arm and forearm, so I can, for example, detect trunk, trunk rotation. I can, try, I can have trackers in the chest where I can identify lateral trunk compensation. So uh, the the specialists, the therapists, together with the computer guy, then can configure all the system. Now I'm going to show you some of the results. This is when we first arrived in our biomedical engineering lab. And uh, the patient was using something very simple, no trackers, and a very uh, not, not very good game there, just go from one, one point to another point. So with our approach, we took him to a virtual environment where he can play with the ego, right? And I can identify compensation. When compensation is not taking place, the ego responds. But when he does a trunk, for example, a trunk movement, I can identify the compensation and then there is no movement. So somehow the system tells the patient, you are doing in a wrong fashion. Please try not to do that. Because if you do so, this is going to not help you to recover your, your arm. 
So in order to identify if the system is really working well, we put here this yellow line. It is a region where the, the therapist say, if he stays in this region, it's okay. But if he passes this region, and I can detect in this yellow line, compensatory movement is taking place, and we need to avoid that. So here, the patient is doing well, but when he does a trunk compensation, the system can detect, so we can show the user he's not doing a, a very well movement, and then the system uh, lets him know that he has to change. So this is for another example for elbow, as you can see here. There he's working well in this area. So but when he or her, she rise a little bit the elbow, in the areas where she rise the elbow, I can identify, and there is no movement in the ego. So somehow, uh, the system uh, help the patient to avoid compensatory movements. And this is one of the patients in the initial of my speech. Now you can see her using the platform, and she is not compensating. Okay, so the platform also helps, and this is a physical therapist together with her, beside her, and somehow the, she can analyze through the platform and the virtual game that she is doing a good job, is not compensating anymore. So after these experiments, we came across to some conclusions. Uh, we, I believe that this proposed system has a potential value to help therapists and even patients to recover from the movement from a stroke. And uh, this can show that a rehabilitation can be more and more progress, progressive uh, uh, with this kind of the compensatory detection. Uh, and we also understand that providing therapists with this kind of tool is also very important. So because sometimes, again, has to rely on his eye, and sometimes he asks the patient to do the, the movements back home, and the patient doesn't do the, this movement very well. So this one, we believe, it's easiest for them to detect the compensatory movements. And with the system, the, the, the therapist can follow the progress of the patient because everything is registered. We can uh, save every situation for each patient. And uh, if you provide this, I would say, this entertainment environment, but with the objective to recover, is much more, at least as we heard for the patients, is more and more exciting to do the protocols, the rehabilitation, the motor rehabilitation protocols, rather than doing a chair something isolated. So we believe that this feedback that the system gives to the patient help him and the therapist to better uh, evolve the recovery process for the patients. And as we can see, somehow, is something that we understand is very important in a virtual environment for training, is to adapt. So if the user does something wrong, the system adapt itself and stop. And uh, as future work, I'm gonna mention this, we intend to show the patients what to do and what not to do. At this moment, only the therapist is telling them to do or not to do things. And for us, besides virtual reality, serious game, adaptive system, this is an important key for us, sensory feedback. So the virtual environment tells the patient or the user what's not doing well. Because most of the system you are seeing using games with the virtual reality, there is nothing like that. So uh, somehow, the patient is there doing the training, but not is coming, okay? But if you provide this kind of feedback, we believe we can help them more. <coughs> and uh, before I finish, I just want to comment 
something that my lab is investing now because we believe in the potential, potential of this technology. Virtual reality with zero games is a very good platform to help training. So we're doing some work together with Qatar University for people who lost their arms, so they need to do some prosthesis training. In Brazil, most of uh, people who lost their, their arm comes from work accidents, but in their case, there are a lot coming from uh, war zones. So to learn how to control a, a prosthesis is not an easy task as well. So we are betting in this technology, virtual reality with serious games and also sensory feedback to help better the patient how to do a very good rehabilitation process. Uh, so as future work, we are trying to extend this uh, platform so in this game so we can have different kind of uh, compensatory movement detection. And we want to use, at this moment, we are using it inside our lab, but we want to take it to clinical uh, stations, to hospitals, so where doctor, physical therapists can follow better with the patient in the hospitals. And for the therapists, when a patient is doing a compensatory movement, it's important to identify which muscle he is using for their compensatory movement and which muscle he is not using, because there are some that it should be used. So we, pro we intend to provide a muscle skeletal model together with this game to help the therapist to understand what's really happened inside the arm, in, inside each muscle, which muscle is working properly, properly which one is not. Uh, and again, uh, providing more compensatory movements, providing more uh, challenges in the game, we believe that we can help therapists and doctors to have a better way to provide the diagnosis for the patient. Going for the final remarks, I would like to present, this is our team, okay? Those are all the authors of this paper. Here you have uh, computer scientists, biomedical engineers, uh, computer engineers, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and doctors. This is a multidisciplinary team, and those are all the authors of the paper, okay? So what this team wants to do is to get this guy after a stroke to have a better quality of life. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.
organization trying to do a movement that they cannot do it. So we intend to tell the platform to stop him, to block him, and not allow him to go further. Like, for example, he's controlling the ego, and then when he's doing a, a wrong movement, there's a kind of wind that stops the movement and tells him, do not do that. So it's, it's possible, and we believe uh, in, in a short time we provide the platform as well. Because this is what I mentioned before, it's very important for the sensory feedback. the system by herself. And by the last month of, I would say, two or three months ago, we started with uh, real patients. Okay. But at this moment, only two has have tried the, the system. As a future work, as I mentioned before, we want to go to clinical uh, hospitals and to use inside hospital, inside health clinics, so we can have a wider number of patients. Okay. And what sort of uh, like way in the process of the application uh, were the particular patients that you were testing? Uh, that came from the therapist. Okay. Right? So they are not in the same phase. Right? Some of them are the very beginner and some of them are in a step forward. Okay? But the patients who come to us are selected by the health people, okay? <coughs> but there are different stages of the stroke recovery. Okay. <coughs> Just one thing. Sorry. Yes. Uh, for the uh, past design, is, is, is it um, designed to address certain type of injury or limitation, or it just uh, goes across the board? So any type. are just working with patients have problems in their arms, okay? Plasticity, they cannot move, they need to compensate it only in this part of the body, on arms, okay? But from our experience, we identify that we can for other parts of the body, like legs and walking, <coughs> things like that. But at this moment, only the arms. But it's possible. So, I cannot tell you exactly how we can do it for your specific problem. Okay? Maybe you have to change some sensors, some trackers. I need medical evaluation. What can we do in our case? But we have this belief that that's possible. Thank you very much.
Do you need a laser at all, or? Okay, I think, well, you know how to use it probably, but, and you'll have to turn probably in point. Okay. So. Yeah, I think we got five minutes, so. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, the best paper session two. Uh, this is our last pr presentation for the day. Uh, it's from the Human Performance Analyst and Engineering Sub Subcommittee. And our presenter is Caleb uh, uh, Fatrell. Okay. And he, he's a PhD student uh, 
and Research Assistant at Vanderbilt University uh, in the Department of Computer Science with a focus in intelligent systems. Uh, he's working at the Institute for Software Integrated Systems. Caleb's research focus is on combining theoretical foundations supporting human-centered simulation and simulation-based training. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Caleb. Thank you very much for uh, coming today. And um, it's my honor to be here on behalf of the HPA subcommittee um, and be presenting today. Uh, so as mentioned, we're going to be talking about automated assessment of team performance using multimodal Bayesian learning analytics. Um, so as most of you here probably know, uh, basic training environments break down into three categories, right? Live, virtual, and constructive. Uh, but what do these things have in common? Well, a lot of things. But what we're interested in for this paper is data. Um, all of these types of environments produce lots and lots of data um, and lots and lots of rich data. So our work at a very high level focuses on generating objective assessment and actionable feedback from trainee data across any type of these training environments. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take away the fact that uh, that is possible and we can do it on real data. <laughs> um, and today we're going to be demonstrating that on a case study of mixed reality training. Um, so that's our kind of environments that we're working with for this case study. Um, it's a mixed reality training environment called the SAMT. Uh, basically, we have soldiers that are moving around in a space that's created by three screens, and on the three screens is projected a VBS simulation. Uh, the soldiers' weapons are interfaced with the digital simulation uh, so that it reacts kind of dynamically to the content that's on the screen. And then to objectively model performance, uh, we use something called cognitive task modeling, or CTA. Uh, and basically what this is, is we talk with domain experts, we review all the relevant literature in the field manuals, and we watch lots and lots of example videos, and we build a hierarchical model. And now this model breaks down high-level tasks, like teamwork, into their component subtasks um, until, and so the high levels of the model are very abstract in general. Uh, and then as we go deeper and deeper in the hierarchy, it gets more and more observable with data, more and more concrete, until at the lowest levels we get to basic kind of activities, movements, and interactions. For this particular study, we adopted a cognitive task model known as the hierarchical, affective, behavioral, and cognitive model of teamwork. Um, this is a model that I developed um, in the past year or so in consultation with lots of uh, domain experts on teamwork. Um, for this particular study, we're using a slight modification. Um, it, the base model has three components, affective, behavioral, and cognitive. In this study, we're studying just the behavioral and cognitive uh, because we didn't have the data to support affective. But in future work, we're going to be focusing on affective components as well. So this is the basic model. Um, so let's break it down a little bit because it does look a little bit complex at first. At the high level, we have kind of abstract teamwork concepts. So we have abstract teamwork breaking down into cognitive and behavioral components. At the mid-levels, we have more concrete teamwork behaviors that you've probably seen before. Things like shared mental models, situational awareness, backup behavior. Um, so those kind of common teamwork parlances. Um, and then at the very bottom level, we have observable performance metrics. So those are things that we can measure with data. Now, those measurable outcomes that we talked about, we compute those using uh, something called multimodal analytics, which is basically just a fancy way to say combining multiple data sources and doing analysis. Um, the metrics here were designed for the data that we have, which is uh, data of infantry teams doing a battle drill called enter and clear a room. Um, the goal of this drill is for the soldiers to enter the room, neutralize any enemy combatants and secure any civilians, and then leave. Um, but the big idea here is that those metrics that you saw at the very bottom levels are designed to be swappable. So we can swap out those five metrics for any drill. So if, say we had new data come in that uh, was uh, break contact, for example, instead of enter and clear room. All we'd have to do is re-engineer those metrics and the rest of the analysis would remain the same. So keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. 
And so these are the five metrics that we defined for this particular study. Um, points of domination, move along walls, entrance vectors, total entry time, and entrance hesitation. And they basically represent uh, kind of psychomotor skills that in consultation with domain experts, we've come up with um, ways of evaluating um, psychomotor skills that go into enter and clear a room specifically. In this study, the analytics, uh, the processing of the data comes from video analysis. So we take video up there of soldiers as they actually interact in this environment, right? And then we apply AI techniques to motion track them. That's what you see on the top screen. And we use an algorithm called MFSort for that. So we produce those bounding boxes around the soldiers, and then we project those onto a sort of map view of the environment. So right here's the door that they came in, and they, you can see the different tracks as they move around the room. Um, and then based off of those tracks on the map view, we can compute those five performance metrics, those analytics. In the future work, we're also going to plan to include other or metrics that are derived from other components, like uh, speech, biometrics, log data, things like that. But for the case study, we're using mostly video data. So let's bring it back to the cognitive task model, right? Again, reviewing. At the high level, we have abstract teamwork concepts. At the mid-level, we have those concrete teamwork behaviors. And at the low levels, we have observable performance metrics. Now, this is a great model on its own, but you might be asking, right, how does this evaluate performance at any level above the performance metrics? So let's drill into what, how we model a specific node in this model. We use a three-state learner model. Um, so we say at any given time, the soldiers or the trainees uh, can be in the below expectation, at expectation, or above expectation states uh, with some probability associated with each of those. Then we have those bottom level performance metrics. So in order to convert from the numeric performance metrics that we calculated with our video analysis to these three states, we just do a simple quantization. So we take those uh, scores that we get on the raw performance metrics, which are scaled between zero and one, and we use a cutoff threshold. Say below 0.3, we call it below expectation, for example. But then after we have those at the very bottom level quantized into these three states, we can propagate them up the hierarchy. So we take those observable variables at the bottom of the hierarchy and we propagate them up in order to inference about normally unobservable concepts. Because you can't normally directly observe backup behavior or coordination. So that's where this technique becomes really cool because by taking this low level data, these numeric performance metrics and using Bayesian inference, this Bayes net model, we can gain inference about the high level, um, higher level uh, teamwork components. So if you're familiar with Bayes Nets models, you'll know that they need two things, uh, two probabilities. They need conditional probabilities and they need prior probabilities. Conditional probabilities basically means one thing is related to another and we represent those by those arrows in this diagram. So for example, if we look at uh, cooperation here, we might say that cooperation is conditionally dependent on performance of backup behavior. And performance on backup behavior is conditionally dependent on entrance vectors, total entry time, and entrance hesitation, for example. Then prior probabilities are a way of representing sort of prior performance and prior experience. So we represent this by a probability that the team is in each state. If you have a really experienced team, say the one that's been training together for 10 years, they're very likely, with a very high probability, going to be in the at or above expectation state on these things, right? But if you take a team that's right out of basic training, they're with very high probability going to be in the below expectation state. So it's a way of representing that kind of prior experience before we begin our analysis. So we start with the computed lowest level performance metrics and use Bayesian inference to propagate up the model. But the cool thing is we can do this multiple times. Instead of just doing this once for one training drill, 
we want to do this over and over again as the soldiers continue training and continue doing their reps and sets. And we can continue updating the probability states as we do that. We do that by treating the model as something called a dynamic Bayes net, uh, which basically is a fancy way of saying that performance evaluation is based on a combination of their actual observed performance and the current drill and their historical performance. So it's a combination of his history and observed performance. So how we do that, right? At the start, we initialize the model. That's those prior probabilities that I was talking about earlier, based off of the experience of the team. Then we run a training drill, and we observe evidence, those performance metrics. That's those D and E, those yellow ones at the very bottom of the hierarchy. So then by combining the D and E, the observed performance, with the prior performance, or the prior probability, we can gain an inference about A, B, and C, about those higher level concepts. And then we do it again. <laughs> um, so for the second training run, we take the observed performance, the new observed performance, and combine it with the previous observed performance. So by um, combining together both history and the current state, we can get a really good idea about the current uh, state of the team and how well they're performing. So what does this look like in practice, right? So for this case study, we followed two fire teams of three to four soldiers over the course of a day of training um, on the Enter and Clear on Sam T. And this is basically what it looks like. And now this is a lot to break down at a first glance, right? Um, so let's, let's kind of break it down slowly together. Um, if you'll recall, I mentioned that we use a three-state learner model, below, at, and above expectation. That's represented by colors here. Red is below expectation, yellow is at expectation, and green is above expectation. On the x-axis, we have training iterations. Those are your reps and sets. So you see those small little vertical lines um, that divide each block? That represents the boundary between each rep and set. So each training exercise. Then on the y-axis, we have those HABC model competencies. So those teamwork competencies and those performance metrics that we saw earlier. Starting at the very bottom, we have those performance metrics, and then those mid-level metrics, and then those top-level teamwork metrics. And by plotting this, this graph like this, we can kind of see performance as the day goes on, right? We can see they start to transition in a lot of their performance to from below expectation to at expectation. And we can do this for both teams, right? Here's the graph for the second team. And you can notice there are a lot of similarities in kind of the high level behaviors where they start to transition, but there are also some differences. So let's zoom in on some of those differences by taking a look at just this slice of the graph. So this is the level three teamwork for team one and team two. And what do we notice from this? Well, team two had much better backup behavior than team one did. That's that very top um, metric in each of those uh, slices of the graph. So we can see team one was below expectation for pretty much the whole day, while team two transitioned very quickly to above expectation. So they had much better backup behavior. But on the other hand, team one had much better task comprehension than team two did. So we see kind of the opposite behavior, where team two stayed relatively below expectation, besides this little bit right here, um, while team one uh, transitioned very quickly and maintained that above expectation level of performance. And so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that these methods can highlight the strengths and weaknesses of each team, which is really, really important for personalized training. So from examining the three plots, right, kind of three, or the two plots, sorry, uh, kind of three major themes emerge. One, both teams improved as they trained throughout the day. Two, both teams mastered low-level concepts first with progression on related higher-level concepts later in the day. And three, competency state transitions for higher-level concepts are smoother than transitions for lower-level concepts. So let's drill into each one of these individually. First, both teams improved as they trained throughout the day. So we saw this on the previous graphs, right? We saw them move slowly from below expectation to at expectation, and even sometimes from at expectation to above expectation. 
So we saw that slow increase. But even for those competencies that didn't increase, we still see improvements, right? So this is a, a plot of the probabilities of below, at, and above expectation for adaptability for team one. And basically what you see here is that the red has a downward trend. So the probability that this team is in the below expectation state continues to go down as the day goes on, while the probability that they're in the at expectation state continues to go up. So what this tells us is that even though the team didn't quite reach the threshold to move from one performance state to the other, to move from below expectation to at expectation, they still showed marked improvement throughout the day. Second, both teams mastered low-level concepts first, which then led to the mastering related high-level concepts. Now, this is partially a result of the BaseNet model. Low-level concepts are closer to the evidence variables, are closer to those performance metrics than higher-level concepts, so they need less evidence to change states. But it also kind of mimics what we'd expect to see from a theoretical cognitive perspective, right? Mastering one specific skill is a lot easier than mastering a domain general high level concept. So mastering how to move along the walls in an enter and clear a room scenario is a lot easier than mastering how to communicate well as a team, right? So the behavior that we see in this model matches what we would expect to see. And then third, Competency state transitions for higher level concepts are smoother than transitions for lower level concepts. What does this mean? Well, at the very low levels, there were a significant number of jumps between the states. We saw the teams move between below, at, and above expectations several times throughout the day. At level three, there were only a few transitions. And at level two, there was typically only one transition. Now, this is very sensible, right? because acute changes in the training scenario are very likely to affect domain-specific concepts, but not overall teamwork. So if I add an extra combatant to the room, that might change the team's acute performance on that particular training exercise, but it's probably not going to change their overall teamwork behavior, that much at least. The other nice thing about this is it can be exploited to determine when training should stop for the day. So if you remember those probability plots that we saw before, we can come back to those. This time, we're looking at the very highest level of the model, overall teamwork performance. And what we see for both teams is this asymptotic behavior. At the start of the day, they improve much faster than at the end of the day. Now, this makes a ton of sense, right? Because spaced practice is a thing. <laughs> um, we'd expect that towards the beginning, there's a market improvement, and then there's some amount of diminishing returns. So what we can do is we can continue to plot this as the team trains and say, okay, at the somewhere around here, right, training's starting to saturate, so maybe it's time to switch things up and go to a different exercise for best spaced practice. So what does this mean for stakeholders, right? One is training session personalization. The next session can be tailored to concepts that are still below expectation in the current session. So if today my team shows that I'm below expectation on adaptability, then tomorrow my trainer can tailor that training session to improving my team's adaptability, which is super important for training session personalization. And also, as I just mentioned, sessions can be timed for best spaced practice. So we can take a look at that high level teamwork graph and say, all right, here's where we should stop for the day, or here's where we need to change exercises uh, to start getting more improvement. Next, we have support for after action review. Evaluation results can be given to instructors and trainees to help support discussion during AAR. So I can give these plots of their performance back to an observer controller, or back to an instructor, or back to the trainees, and say, hey, here's where you did well, and here's where maybe you need to have a little bit of improvement, or here's where this scenario didn't go super well. And then that can kind of spark a discussion during that AAR. We have a prototype in progress for this in the Generalized Intelligent Framework for Tutoring in the GIFT software. The third is summative assessment supports. 
So not only can we look at this data across a single day, but we can also look at it across multiple days or across multiple weeks or months. And we can integrate this into a sort of longer term model of trainee performance. So we can say, over the course of the last three to six months, you've shown X amount of improvements. And so we can really start to get summative assessment and readiness evaluation. Or is this team ready to go in the field together? The other nice thing is the hierarchical nature of the HABC model means we can swap out the low level performance metrics for other performance metrics if we move to a different drill. So again, I mentioned this earlier, but if we move from enter and clear a room to break contact, all we need to do is swap out those low level metrics. And then we're, we have two different drills that are providing evidence for the same high level variables. So it becomes much more robust. And then finally, just as a piece of future work, right? These techniques we're currently working on integrating into the Army's Generalized Intelligent Framework for Tutoring, GIFT, I mentioned that. Um, and they're being used to directly inform the STE Experiential Learning for Readiness, Steel R data strategy. So we had a great talk earlier, if you were at uh, Best Paper Session 1, about Steel R. Um, and these techniques, this Bayesian uh, modeling, is being used to help inform the math model and the data strategy for uh, Steel R. So that's kind of where we're going with this. And if you want to find out more about that, I'd encourage you to come down to the DevCom booth uh, on the show floor, uh, and we can uh, discuss it more in depth. I think we have time for some questions. Yeah. Hi. Did the initial prior assessments um, make a difference? Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, so if we have a team that has trained together um, then we can set those initial prior assessments to higher levels. And then um, what that does is it basically adjusts the rate at which uh, the model learns so that we can say, hey, if you have 15 years of experience, um, you're probably not going to need as many drills to get to the above expectation state than a team that's brand new, right? Uh, in this particular case study, uh, we were working with non-naturalistic teams, so we started them all at the below expectation states. But uh, I could imagine in the future, right, doing some sort of initial assessments to get those initial probability values, like say have the team run the drill two times or something, uh, to get those initial probability values, and then continue the training after that or something like that. So it does definitely affects it. Yeah, sure, that's a great question. Um, validation is definitely something that we are still working on, um, but something we've also done a little bit already. So one thing that we've done in the initial parts of this was uh, look at the observer controller feedback uh, that they were giving to the trainees and kind of correlate that with the performance that we saw on these graphs. And we saw a pretty good match between what we would, um, the concepts that we saw uh, that were uh, kind of high and low in each scenario, and the feedback that the instructors were giving to the soldiers, right? Um, so in that sense, there is some sort of validation there where we have that observer controller feedback to help validate uh, the higher level concepts. We're also looking into uh, employing some other kinds of assessment metrics um, to help validate the model. So in the cognitive science literature, there's lots of uh, assessments for teamwork uh, and for some of those higher level concepts. So what we'd like to do is run another study um, where we can run this model and get an evaluation of their higher level performance and then have them take those traditional kind of uh, cognitive assessments and compare across the two. We haven't been able to do that yet, but it's something we'd like to do in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so the conditional probability tables, that's a good question. Um, in this case, they were hand-designed. Um, 
because we didn't have enough data to train them on their own. So uh, we basically reviewed the Army field manuals, we talked to instructors, and based off of that, we hand designed the conditional probability tables. Uh, but what we do like to do in the future is collect a bunch of this data so that we can learn the conditional probabilities of the BayesNet model automatically from a uh, machine learning approach. Yeah, sure. So the way it works is basically at the lowest level, at those performance metrics, we have to set a threshold. Um, those, again, were designed in consultation with domain experts. Um, but for the higher levels, we actually don't have to threshold it at all because what we get is a probability of each state. Um, so we get a probability that the team is in below expectation probability that the team is in at expectation and probability that the team is in above expectation. And then we take the maximum of those, right? They sum to one, so they're theoretically, the maximum is the most likely states. So the, the difficult part of it was hand designing the, the cutoff thresholds at the bottom. But again, that's something that we can eventually learn from data once we get enough uh, data to support all of that. Uh, we did not do that for this study, but that is uh, just because of we didn't have enough data to do it. Um, well, we didn't have enough data to do it with statistical significance, at least. Um, so uh, for this study, we didn't, uh, but we'd like to do that in the future. Yeah, we could t uh, potentially see that. Um, we, we definitely saw a couple of the metrics where um, the first one was below expectation, the second one was at expectation, and the third was above expectation, right? That's probably an anomaly that comes from the prior values, um, which again, we'd like to fix with future training data, or at least adjust with future training data. That's the model learning a little bit. Um, with the longer term plateaus, um, it's likely not because of just the model adjusting, um, because for one thing, we saw those plateaus over the course of more like 10 to 15 training scenarios, um, which at that point is long enough that we could say with some degree of confidence that the model is already adjusted. Um, but also because those are uh, higher level and less close to the observable variables, uh, the priors are a little bit less sensitive to that, um, if that makes sense. But again, that's definitely a limitation of the current study is the hand design nature of it. Um, as we continue to get data and continue to run studies, uh, that limitation will start to go away. Yeah, so um, it comes down to the design of the cognitive task model, right? Um, and how that adaptability or whatever metric you're trying to measure um, is connected to those low level metrics. In our case, we connected, um, here, let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, in our case, we connected adaptability to uh, certain metrics, uh, in this case, move along wall and entrance vectors, um, which are specifically uh, things that, oh, I 
realize I'm not presenting. <laughs> Um, which are specifically things that are can change between scenarios, right? Move along walls can change because the layout of the room changes. Um, entrance vectors can change because you never know which direction the person in front of you is going to enter. And so um, the way we've hand designed this and the way we've designed it in consultation with experts, um, those dynamics are kind of captured in those performance metrics. So. You, the, the upfront cost of doing this method is really design of those performance metrics to make sure you're capturing the, all of the dynamics of the scenario. In this case, we were focusing on psychomotor dynamics, but um, again, uh, you have to be really careful about designing those things to make sure you're capturing the full gambit of things. Yeah, so uh, in this particular study, um, we followed two teams over the course of about 30 drills each. Um, so it was a fairly small study overall. Um, we'd like to continue getting data. We have some more data that's coming to us soon. Um, we're currently in IRB kinds of things with that um, uh, to help validate this methods even more. Um, but again, it's just a matter of being able to get in the room with the trainees, collect the data, and actually uh, be able to analyze it. So we'd love to do more studies uh, in the future with larger sample sizes. together, so we are here in person. We're not sure if they're here. <laughs> Set order. Each one of the presenters kind of do a few slides and kind of set the stage, and then we're going to open.